Cool. Thanks, Ray. Um, so welcome to the May 13th uh, edition of our GitLab Runner Open Office Hours. Um, the intent by this call is really to talk about anything to do with the runner that's kind of on anyone's mind. Um, if this is obviously perfectly timed and completely intentionally with the uh, current hackathon that's going on for GitLab. And so if anyone's got a MR they've started or thinking about making a contribution to the runner, um, we'd be more than happy to talk about it, give some direction, give some feedback. Um, we can do that live. Uh, and barring that, what we'll do is kind of just talk about some things that are um, probably helpful to anyone going through that process and going through that or, or, or considering doing that. Um, the call is going to be recorded and then we'll share it to YouTube once the video processing thing goes uh, goes through. It's not actually being live streamed. Um, and so if any of this is helpful, someone can come back and, and look at it again later. Anyone on the call, please feel free to jump in and uh, unmute at any time and just ask a question. Um, we'll probably pause and, and just check in on that if anyone uh, uh, to try and pull some questions out if anyone has any as we go through um yeah and i think today the plan to start off is actually uh to get tomas who is one of our senior engineers on the team to give a bit of not actually a review but actually just kind of talk us through a bit of a walkthrough of like the life cycle from a uh, of how the runner sees a CI job. Um, any questions, anything else we missed going over? I don't actually have a script I'm reading, so I'd probably do this a little bit differently every time. Nothing? Okay. Um, Tomas, you wanna get started? Sure. Okay, so let me show my screen. And we will do a little walk through through the sources of GitLab Runner and see how the CI job is being handled by the runner. Because after all, uh, this is what is the, the main purpose of the runner, to execute all of our jobs. So uh, the runner as a process when, when it started, we we know that it uh, that it may have different executors that execute the job in different uh, in different ways using different technologies. But there is a common part for any kind of runner deployment that we will have. This is the main process that goes through all runner sections from the config.tom file and asks for jobs for each configured GitLab connection. And then if a job is received, uh, we, start, we start processing it. So our main entry point is the, is the function that we see here. It's the, uh, it's the method that is started when you execute gitlab-runner run command or when you start the GitLab runner process through a system manager because system integration that we have under the hood also uses the run command. So after, after doing some initialization like starting up the metric server, if it's started, if it's configured, start it up the session server and few few other things. We at this line start a go routine. Let's Let's go there. This is the main Go routine that triggers job requests. This is where the check interval from config.tom file is being uh, used and being interpreted. So what's most important here is that we check how many runners sections, I mean the, these ones from the config.tom file, we have defined. For each 
I think each every one minute runner checks if the config file was changed. If it was changed, then we reload it. And, and then we start tracking also the new entries or we stop tracking the, the old that were removed. Anyway, at this moment, we know that we have several uh, runners that we want to proceed with. Let's say that that in our example case, we, we have one runner process that was registered three times each time in a separate project on our GitLab installation. So we have three project level specific runners. Uh, with, with, this, with this function, we will trigger the request for each of these registered runners. Uh, each check interval seconds. The, uh, the interesting part that may be surprising for some people is that the interval between handling, between starting a request for a specific runner's entry is equal to check interval. However, if we have more than one runner's entry is defined, if we have more than one runner's register for one config.tom file, then the overall number of, of requests will be bigger than one could think about. Like if we have the three example runners that I said, if we define check interval as nine seconds, then between two sub subsequent requests for project A, the runner that is registered for project A, we will get this nine seconds uh, waiting time. However, we will generate three different requests in these nine seconds, each one after, after three seconds, because this is what's, uh, what's taken here. And then knowing what is the, what is the, 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 the sleeping time, what is the, the, the pause between generating requests, uh we we use the uh the method name fit runner to uh to go to go forward so let's let's go and quickly see uh there is nothing special happening here except that we check if the runner is healthy by runner is healthy we mean that if we were receiving errors on network communication for a few uh, subsequent requests, then we mark a runner as unhealthy. And then we stop asking such GitLab instance for new jobs for some time. I'm, I don't remember now how long time it is. We would need to dig in one of the files. However, this is, this is the place where we check this healthy status of a, of a specific runner and we forward only go forward only if, if the runner is marked as healthy. And this is a little go magic about how, how you can uh, pass data between uh, different asynchronous go routines. However, what we are interested in how this ends is the method named process runners. Uh, this is a grow routine. We can see that it started a little above. This is a grow routine that waits for a specific runner entry to be triggered to go forward. And, and not focusing much on what's happening here at this moment, let's go to the process runner method. And here the magic begins. First, we, uh, we check on the executor provider if we even are able to do anything. 
uh, we'll not focus on this right now. Maybe maybe at the end there will be a little time to to say what is the difference of acquire and release between let's say Docker executor and and shell executor. Uh, however, this is this is a quite important step. This is something that powers, for example, the GitLab.com shared runners that are using the Docker machine executor. If we get from the executor provider positive response that we have that we have some capacity to execute the jobs, uh, we then call another acquire method, which is named acquire build, which checks uh checks us against the configured limit so we have we have the uh general level concurrency setting which defines the the, the maximum number of concurrent jobs that will be handled by the runner no matter from which runner century it is uh, coming on but then for each of the entries we can define a specific limit and and this is the place where this is checked. So we check if the specific runner entry that we now try to handle is, uh, is allowed to execute any, any new job. Let's say that we can, we can go ahead. We are still in limit. Uh, create session, this is, this is a helper method that we use to to start the the box session server if we have this configured this is not the in the scope of what we will be talking about today and here it is request the job so let's let's dive into it and this method is the one that finally uh finally triggers the the http uh, request to gitlab api to get the job, so we already we already passed several checks, and we still don't even know if there is a job waiting for us. Uh, first, we are checking yet again if another limit we have the uh, request concurrency. I think request con concurrency setting on the runner section. Uh, which is which is checked at this at this place. If again we are still in the limit, if we are allowed to generate another request to to the GitLab uh, GitLab API, we call the network request job uh, method, and this is finally the moment when we talk with GitLab. And then the magic happens on the GitLab side. GitLab checks what kind of runner is asking for a job. Uh, if uh, if the runner is even uh, authorized for this, if if the token is matching, uh, GitLab makes the the tags matching at this moment, so it sees what runner asks for a job. It has a list of jobs that could be available for such runner and then does some such such magic like checking the tags checking the ci minutes for example if this is the shared runner on, on gitlab.com and hopefully at this moment we get the job payload with all of the information about the job that we are interested and saying about this we can go to the Job response definition. If someone is interested, how the uh, job requesting API payload is defined, then the common uh, slash network dot go file, and this structure is the starting point. This structure and all of the all of the structures that it that it inherits and, and composes defi defines us the full information about the job that we get. Runner is 
uh, runner is not aware of anything outside of what it get here. Runner doesn't work in a pipeline context. Runner doesn't work in a project context. It doesn't know anything about uh, about the, the 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 specific pipeline settings that you may be set in the GitLab CI YAM file. Runner cares only about the specific payload of a specific job that was received. So if something is here, we can handle it in, in any way. If something is not here, then we will not know such things. Let's get back to, to our request job. So at this moment, at this moment, we have the full information about, uh, about the job. Uh, the next important thing that happens here is the network process job call. Uh, this is something that finally starts the trace handling. So this is again another go routine that asynchronously uh, works and handles uh, updates of the job status and the job trace. And we will get back to this to this place in a few moments. So we requested a job. Uh, we requested the job. And here in this defer function, uh, we can see the initial uh, in each other, the, 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 the final thing that will happen with the job. So checking if we even have any errors that, that happened. But this will be the, the final step of our job lifetime. So let's skip it for a moment. And here, here is some things that we do at, at the background. So having the, the, the job data payload we create a common build object. We assign a few things to it. This is a place where we update uh, some Prometheus metrics that you can export from the runner. And finally, we can call build run, which starts the job processing. Uh, in build run, the most important call uh is is in fact here because all of this is still a preparation um, setting some contacts defining the, the the build logger that is a way how we uh, how we let's say multiplex the log messages so that they can be saved in a runner process log but also sent to the job trace but at this moment we have we have the executor that we will use to handle the job. We should have it ready. And we can, we can call the run method to proceed the execution. And this place here is where the execution starts. So after all of the preparation in the previous methods and, and here, we start the job execution in a separate go routine. And then this is a place where we wait for the job to be finished. And as you can see here, there are three possible ways how the job can be, uh, job execution can be interrupted. First, uh, maybe, let's let's go from the from the reverse order the the last one but the the one that is most important for all of us is that the job was finished it it could be finished with a failure it could be finished with a positive um positive result but at any case here we will get either an error or a nil representing that the job finished successfully and this can be immediately processed and we can start getting back to 
to finalize the, the job processing. The second way is the signal received on the system interrupt structure field. Uh, this is something that is propagated from the multi.go. For example, when you will uh, start the runner in the foreground and you will hit control C or when you will send the kill signal or the, uh, I'm sorry, not the kill signal, the, the sector sig signal or the sequit signal several times. At some moment, the uh, runner decides that the interrupt signal was sent and it starts propagate the signal down to the, to the uh, go written stack. And this is one of these places. So when we receive this interrupt signal from, uh, from the user, we just stop the job. And then there is another place where we uh, send the information to the job script execution itself to be, uh, to be interrupted and to be, to be stopped uh, in whatever context it is executed. And the last thing is the, is the context, the context that we pass here to the run method. At the moment when the context is finished, we also uh, finish job processing and then we try to uh, interrupt the job. Uh, if we will exit from this select, then we send the cancel to the job in case if this was one of these two uh, situations, and we wait for the for the job to be finished, to to just finally uh, finally handle all of the left uh, left steps. However, we said that we start the job, but we didn't see how it is started. So let's go here, and this method describes in what steps, how we name it, uh, the job is executed. And what we can see here, we can see that we have some prepare, get sources. This is the place where we either uh, call git clone or git fetch, uh, all of the things that are happening around. This is the place where the git LFS commands are executed. This is the place where the sub modules are handled. And since, uh, I don't remember, Steve, 12, 7, 12, 8, when we introduced the uh, messaging in the job trace, each of these, each of these steps is described in the, in the job block. Uh, that would be 12, 9, I think. I think it was 12, 12 fight. Anyway, a little above you can, you can see how each of these constants is mapped to a, to a text that you can see in the job, uh, job output like right now. So everything that happens after getting sources from Git repository and before the next line that that will represent a step is happening through this. Uh, restore cache is a place where we try to, to restore the cache, either the local one or, or download it from the remote cache like GCS or S3. Uh, download artifacts is the moment where we use the job payload to download all artifacts that were defined for this job to be downloaded. And as you can see here, the, the construction of the error checking, each failure of each of these steps, except of, uh, of one that I will point in a moment, is something that stops the job processing later. So if we will have an error on the, on the, on the prepare step, then all of this will never happen and we finally will go back with the error taken from the from the prepare step. 
this is the place that the users are mostly interested in because this is where the before script and script are executed. The important thing to know is that before script and script, uh, while there are two separated entries in the GitLab CI YAML definition, and the before script can be also set on a general level. So we, we could say that there are three different places in the GitLab CI YAML where, where these scripts are defined. In the job execution, they are just concatenated and executed together. So the before script and the script share the same shell execution context. So anything that was prepared, exported, uh in the before script anything that relies on the shell context will be also available in the script and here we can see the after script execution and this is this is one of the things i'm sorry here we can see the after script execution this is one of the things that that we know is a little confusing users like why if i prepare a ssh agent in my before script why i can access it in the after script this is because after script is executed in a totally separate context why there are two reasons first after script was introduced as a way to do some cleanup no matter if the main build script uh, failed or not and we can't uh, put them in one shell execution script because we fail the script immediately on a detected command fail so if something would fail in the before script or in the in the things defined in the script we would never reach the the parts defined by the after script the second thing is that if after script fails, we don't want it to affect the final job uh, result. You can see that this is the only B execute stage call where we don't care about the error. In fact, to make it explicit, we should, we should do it like that. We give this after script place as a, as a moment that will be executed off always, no matter if the script or the before script failed or not. And we also don't care about the result of this. So you can use it, you can do any cleanup if, if you want, uh, but it will not affect your job if it will fail. After Finishing the script execution, we uh, we get back to a few predefined steps. The one is cache archiving. So again, saving it to a local archive and additionally sending this local archive to a remote cache server is such as uh, configured. And then we have uh, uploading the artifacts. And here we can see that it's either uploaded on success or uploaded on failure. This is where we re respect the uh, when setting from the artifact session. And something added quite recently, upload referees. Referees is a nice uh, feature of the runner that we started experimenting with. This is something that, for example, allows us to uh, request some Prometheus metrics pre-configured in the, in the configuration file and upload them as a, another type of an artifact. Uh, it's not popular yet. We are, we are still experimenting with this, but, but there is a, a lot of power that we that we see in this in this small call and then if we went through all of these executions we have three possibilities first one is that we had an error before calling the upload artifacts in that case this is the error that we are mostly interested in if the job failed 
we tried to upload the artifacts on failure and the artifacts upload also fail, then the job failure for us is more important. So uh, we check it and we send it up to the call stack at first. If we had not uh, seen an error before calling the artifacts upload, then we return, then we return anything that the artifacts upload ended with, which may be an error or maybe a, a, a success. So this is how the steps are defined and let, uh, let us get a quick look on the execute stage, what it does. So skipping all of the logging, we check what shell is defined for the executor that we use. We generate the shell script and this shell script contains things like uh, setting up the variable exports for the variables that were defined. Uh, this defines mm, the configuration that fails the script execution on the first command uh, fail, which is handled differently for bash, which is handled differently for PowerShell, for example. This is where we uh, set the configuration that enables the uh, debug trace output, if the CI debug trace feature is used. And this is, of course, where at the end, all of the, uh, all of the script lines that the user defined are added. What is important to know is that from every each line defined in the before script, script, and after script, we in fact generate two lines in the script. First one is an echo that prints the command. Second one is the command execution itself. So after calling this, we have, we have the script. Uh, we prepare um, executor command structure that will be next used in a proper way by different executors. We define if this is a predefined or not command. So the user script and the after script steps are not the predefined ones. This is what the user have control over on. Everything else is predefined. This is used, for example, uh, in the Docker executor, where we distinguish if the script should be executed in the image defined by the user or in the helper image that, that we provide. And we build and execute the, the build section. And this method here, executor run, is what passes the prepared and ready command to the executor to be finally executed in the final environment. And what happens there is another magic probably for another call. Uh, from this place, what I would like to show is the executor and executor provider interface. Uh, because we have uh, five, six, seven, don't remember the number now. We have several executors that are uh, in our code base. Uh, since 12, two, version 12.2 or 12.1, we have the custom executor, which allows the user to integrate his own execution methods with, with the runner workflow. And these two interfaces uh, show us what is the general flow of using the preparing and, and using the executor. So here we can see, for example, the acquire that we started the, the, the story with. So this tells the runner if the executor at this moment is able to, to execute a job or not. 
And here we can see, for example, the run method, which gets the prepared executor command and then does the execution that we really care about. So at this moment, in this place, we have the job that now is running. So if you're using a Kubernetes executor, this is the moment where the pods are being created and the job is being handled in the, in the pods. If you're using the virtual box, this is the moment when the runner will start connecting with virtual box, creating the virtual machine and then, and then trying to connect with it to execute the script in the, in the virtual machine. Uh, whatever this execution will return, it will be then handled as a job, uh, job result. So if we will get an error here, then in a moment I will show at which, at which place, we will, uh, we will mark the job as fail either as failed because of the script failure or because of the job timeout or failed because of something that was wrong on the runner level. If we don't get an error here, then this is where everyone is happy because we marked the job as succeeded and we can, and we can go further with the pipeline. But before we will go back to the, to the place where we, uh, set the final state of the job. Let's switch for a moment to the trace.go file because we, we've been here for a moment and, and I said that we will get back to this. Uh, as I told a few minutes ago, the trace uh, handling is started almost immediately after we get the job response from GitLab. And, and what's happening inside of this part of the code is the watch loop. Watch loop that is executed constantly uh, in some intervals. I will say in a moment how this interval is defined until the job is finished. And what is happening in this loop is the incremental update. So as the incremental update, we first send the patch trace uh, request. This is something that sends only the new part of the job output that was received from the job script since the last uh, patch request. And if the patch request uh, succeeded, we send the touch job, uh, touch job request uh, to say to GitLab that the job is still working. Let's start with the touch because it's a little shorter. So what's most important here is this part. We basically uh, send information that job with ID that we hold is in state running. We send it to GitLab. What GitLab does at this moment is updating the updated at field of the job object. This prevents the mechanisms in GitLab from uh, considering such job as a stale one that should be uh, should be cleaned should be failed because uh, something happened and the job is no more being updated nor it was finished in the proper way. Uh, what's more interesting is the send patch method uh, where we of course, send the patch trace itself. So again, another API call uh, that just pushes a, a part of the output and, and ensures that the, uh, the ordering is proper and that we don't mess the output improperly. 
But here is something that we implemented in GitLab, I think in 12.7, and then started supporting the, this in GitLab Runner in 12.8. Uh, the update interval defined from GitLab. When we send, uh, when we start the job and we open the job page in GitLab UI, then GitLab detects that the job is being watched. And after each patch trace request, it sends us back how long should be the interval before uh, that we will wait before sending another request. And if we have the job page opened, it will be currently each three seconds. If we close the page or if we even didn't open it because the, the job was started in the background by let's say a git push and we never opened the job in the, in the UI, then GitLab will uh, instruct runner that this request should be sent each 30 seconds. This was a huge improvement that we've made uh, these three releases before to just show the scale on gitlab.com after we released this change. We updated our fleet of 10 runners and some of the users updated their runners. Uh, we had something about 15% of available runners updated and this ended in reducing the number of patch trace requests by half from 40 to 20 million requests per day. So this is, this is something that we were very happy about adding uh, this few releases ago. And this is what happens constantly. We watch the script execution in the, the executor, watch the script execution in the proper way for each of the executors. And through the, through the build logger that I was showing uh, properly in one of the places, it connects to the trace object and it pushes these uh, updates constantly to GitLab so you can then see the job output more or less in a live, uh, lifetime updates. Okay, so let's go back to the to the execution and start finishing this a little so the execution happened through the executor we've got some um, some result uh, so going uh, going back from all of the calls uh, Let's say that we didn't have any any context finished case. No, we don't didn't have the, the interrupt. We finished the we finished the job properly. Uh, we waited for for the for the job to be to be finally marked as finished, and then we get back with the error value here. With the error value here, we have it used first in this place, which is the set uh, trace status. And here you can see that if we didn't have an error, we leave the job succeeded line at the very end of the job output and we mark the trace as success. If we had an error and it was a build error, this is used in only a few places, then we mark the job as job failed and we use trace fail to propagate to this to GitLab properly. If we had an error, but this was not a build error, but something else, this is what we consider to be some either runner internal failure or system internal failure. So for example, using the shell executor, someone deleted bash from the machine where the runner is 
uh, is running. We try to execute the script. We couldn't because there is no shell. It failed. So it would be most probably marked as this job failed by a system fail. So going uh, back for a moment to the job trace file. Uh, success is internally calling fail with mom failure. Fail, what does? It sets the failure reason. And we have on the runner side only three of them. So the script failure, something that is out of our scope because it happened in the, in the script provided by the user. Job execution timeout, when the job script was being executed for too long time, and the runner system failure that I was mentioning a moment ago. And with the finish call, runner tries to do two things. First, send the final uh, trace patch requests until we have something to send if we are still receiving something from the job output then we will try to uh, to send it unless until we will get um, any of the error response from gitlab or until it will be finished and then final status update where we try to send uh, the final update, here we can see that this is the place where we set the state of the job, where we pass the failure reason that was detected on runner side. And we loop through this until, uh, until we get one of these states. If there is some internal failure, then we will try to repeat. So back, 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 back. And we are in the, in the run. So we are exiting from here. We got back to the defer defined in the runner command process runner, which again tries to fail the job with the trace in case if it was some strange um, some strange case that, that it was not handled before. And this is done. After calling this defer function, uh, the job is uh, the job is being released by the runner we call with another defer uh, release the build, which for example, updates the Prometheus metrics. We finally call the provider release, which in case of some some, some executors restores some of the capacity. And at this moment, the job is no longer existing in the GitLab runner. What happens next? is happening in GitLab. Thanks for sharing that, Tomas. Um, I, there's actually a, a YouTube video I'll link to, uh, I'll put it in the chat right now, but I'll also put it in the description of this once we upload it, that kind of shows how this all looks at a bit higher level from the GitLab side. It's by GitLab, I mean the GitLab Rails application. Um, so kind of where, um, Tomas's walkthrough starts and ends. Um, uh, that conversation kind of goes over. So it's pretty cool, pretty interesting. Some good diagrams. It's I think it's more looking at diagrams kind of at that level than say looking at uh, uh, the code walkthrough, like at a, at a lower level, like what we just went through. Cool. Thanks, Tomas. Yeah, I also pasted a MR from Sashi who's online. And I think Steve, you've already like started looking at that. So in the next like uh, five, 10 minutes or so, I um, was wondering if it's worth just quickly going through it live while we have both of you folks on the phone. 
or yeah. folks on, yeah, uh, on, on Zoom. It's a, yeah, it's a very small merge yeah. request. So uh, let me share my screen. So uh, the goal behind this merge request, if we look at the issue, is um, the runner, the GitLab itself starts supporting more different types of artifacts, right? Before it used just to support zip uh, files that will zip them up and upload them to GitLab. But then it started supporting reports, which is like uh, uh, JUnit reports, uh, test reports, like licensing reports and things like that. And those are like, those are handled differently for the runner and for GitLab as well. So. Um, like uh, this was a suggestion from Tomas actually, and one of the reviews we were having, where we need to be more uh, verbose and explicit what kind of artifact we're uploading. If we are uploading a reports J unit, for example, or a normal artifact, um, and then um, uh, it's Sashi, right? That's how you pronounce your name. Yep, it's Sashi, yep. Perfect, thank you. And then uh, Sashi contacted me, like, uh, can we achieve this in the current uh, code base? Um, I took a look at it, and uh, with what we wanted uh, initially, from the initial discussion, we wanted to just uh, say, uploading artifacts for right? But the runner does not have the information of the reports J in it. Uh, and this goes very well with what Thomas showed earlier, right? The uh, job response. So the communication bet between GitLab runner and GitLab is all through JSON. Um, but uh, GitLab responds with the type. And the type is basically, it's, if it's a J unit, if it's a license management and things like that. But it does not specify the report. So I would, like I said, okay, so, the least changes we can make to make it more clear to the user and I'll send more data uh, to the GitLab runner, to GitLab runner as just print the type. So for example, here, this is just a quick example, uploading artifact as code quality, uploading artifact as license management, for example, or uploading artifact as archive. Uh, so uh, it's a fairly simple change. Um, I already looked at it and I was going to submit two more comments, but uh, the first comment is, uh, I see that we did the quotes here. Now, I imagine that is because of the example I gave here, but Go actually provides this automatically using the percentage uh, Q and it will quote it automatically. It's like percentage S, but with quotes. Um, so that's one comment. And then the other comment, first of all, I really like uh, that you move all this into a single variable. That was one thing I was going to suggest if you weren't going to make it. So I really appreciate that. Now, the next thing is the if else condition. Me personally, I'm not a big fan of if else's. They're just like two branches that you have to take care of. So one way I was going to suggest uh, to do this is having a default value. So let me open up the code. And I like to give examples like with uh, diffs. So if we go to, um, let me open up the editor. Uh, five from nine. So let me check out the branch first. branch now and here we can see you can see this so uh, to get rid of this else condition to make it a bit more clear I would say su I would suggest doing something like this so for example uh, message uh, prefix and just do this. So the default value is that we're gonna upload an artifact, right? 
but if the type is not empty, if uh, the type is not an empty string, uh, we will just do it uh, override it. And this yes, like makes sense. a few lines shorter, a few a bit more clear. And then let me just comment. Ah, I, I was already writing this comment. Perfect. Uh, so I'll edit to the view. And then when I like suggest all the comments, um, I'm pretty sure like we do have tests and we don't have tests to actually check each string. That doesn't make sense because that will end up being a pretty test. But I always enjoy uh, running through manual QA, like let me run this manually as a user to see it as a user. And like sometimes it really helps because sometimes, um, not in this case, but sometimes for example, uh, I wish there was a log to specify that we created container X or that we create volume X. So I, I always enjoy running things uh, uh, manually. So I'm just mm -hmm. gonna run the runner uh, pointing to a local JTK instance. Um, if I go to my JTK instance, I have this project and I should have I think I should have uh, an example a CI example file with all the reports that we well some of the reports that we support. And that's no longer true. So that's that so this is the parts, right? And now if we open up, I don't remember the syntax by heart. Actually, I'll do this on my own time. I, I don't want you to see me struggle writing the CI on the fly. Uh, let's take a look at the codes to see if we can spot that in us. So we fixed this. Um, we fix the if condition and the message prefix is all down here. And we can see that the pipeline is passed, so we didn't mess up any tests. So I think the only thing that is left really is um, doing the manual, manual QA. So I'll submit this review for you to take on and I'll do the manual QA on the fly. So because we're a bit close on time. Um, do you have any other questions? Like, um, do you think things were more simpler? If there's anything else uh, you can tell me? Uh, no, I'm, I'm just getting started with the runner code base. So it's, uh, I'm new to Golang as well. So it's uh, good to Yeah, that's, that, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I, like, it's really nice that he started um, asking in the issue instead of just opening up a merge request because uh, that that helps us guide you in the right direction yeah. and like makes things a lot quicker for you and for us as well. Okay. Um, Tomas, do you have any objections to this change or? Perfect. Um, so yeah, Excellent. as soon as you address this, we can uh, merge it. I'll even assign a milestone before I forget, which I do way too often and they always correct it for me so yes um thanks a lot for this contribution sure yeah thanks, thanks actually for you thanks actually for your contribution it's nice to do a synchronous review yeah <laughs> yeah that was cool yeah yeah cool uh, elliot anything else i guess we're sort of running up against time no we're but. pretty much yeah at time um yeah. no i don't think if i have anything else um thanks for the kind of unusual one uh this month tomas um yeah. what i love about doing this is that we create this artifact and we have this everyone whoever needs to look at it can go back and watch this video later so um, i think that'll be really helpful cool um but yeah good luck with the hackathon thanks cool
All right, I'll uh, get the recording posted after the call as well. So thanks for having me. Have a good day. Yeah, yep. bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.